Good morning, everybody, and we are so happy to be spending this Saturday to you and welcome uh, this Saturday with you and welcome to Denton County Master Gardener Association's Fall Into Gardening. I'm Catherine Wells, President, and I have the great pleasure of introducing two people that help bring all this together today. First of all, we have Daniel Arenas, who's our Director of Education for Denton County Master Gardener Association. He does so much more, which you'll hear about in just a minute, because he's our first speaker today. And also, it's my privilege to introduce Blake Aldridge. He's the Water Coordination the Water Education Coordinator and Water Resource Specialist for Upper Trinity Regional Water District. And this actually was Blake's idea. He came to us several months ago and said, what if we did a series of classes and we partner with you? And we thought, how great would that be? We decided to put it into a big one day event and so here we are. And before we get started, Blake, I'm happy for you to speak to everybody and share anything that you would like to. All right, well, thank you. Good morning. Um, like you said, I'm with Upper Trinity Regional Water District. Uh, we're based in Louisville. And if you live in Denton County, chances are uh, you get your drinking water from us. So we have two water treatment plants here in uh, Denton County, one in Louisville, one in Providence Village. And um, water conservation is a big, um, focus of ours because um, it helps extend our water supply and our water infrastructure. Oh, oh okay. Um, and especially this summer um, with all the massive population growth we've been having, uh, it was more critical uh, than ever for us to conserve water, especially outdoors. And so one of the ways that we um, know that, that we can reduce our outdoor watering is by incorporating native plants. And so that, that's what gave us the idea to um, consult the experts, the master gardeners and the Native Plant Society and others uh, who know much more about this than I do and um, have more resources to uh, teach you all about that. So we have had a uh, campaign over the summer called Water Less Y'all. Uh, there are some t-shirts at the back and some other uh, goodies and things like that that are free for you. So, uh, and if you happen to see on your phone or um, something like that, a, a little ad come across, uh, you can remember the the bald guy that um, was from Upper Trinity, that that's, that's his campaign. So, um, but I do want to greatly thank the Master Gardeners and Daniel and Bill Akers and the Global Sphere Center for hosting this. Um, so I won't take any more time um, and let, let y'all continue. Thank you. Thank you so much, Blake. And in addition to Upper Trinity Regional Water District, as I mentioned, we're also thrilled to be partnering today with Global Sphere Center, which is where you are, these wonderful grounds and this wonderful property, and particularly the Beulah Acres Agroforest, which you'll hear a little bit more about in just a minute. And before we hit the highlight of the morning, which is Daniel's presentation, I'm going to turn it over to Daniel, and he's going to tell you some very important housekeeping tips and tricks for today, including where the bathrooms are located. Great. Hello. Don't need this. Put this away for a second. Okay. Can everybody hear me okay? Awesome. Well, again, thank you. It is a pleasure for us to have you here. There are more people coming in. Uh, I'm proud of y'all because y'all were on time. So already gold star for everybody in the classroom. Um, Quick housekeeping, we start with bathrooms is the question that everybody asks. So it's just we're trying to get you situated throughout the day. Hopefully you will stay here because you're watching the first class. You will stay here to the very last class, right? So bathrooms are right there. Male and female, there's a water fountain. Um, there are plenty of stalls for everybody. Um, don't fight over a stall, just wait for your turn. Be friendly and mindful. Um, you know, full schedule, uh, we do have to do our best to honor the beginning of each class. Be here 
uh, before it starts. So you do have a program. If you do not remember, on the main entrances, there are signs saying what time the classes starts and end. So I would ask for your cooperation to be here on time. So that way, uh, none of the speakers have to rush and try to push through the presentation, and not give you everything you can possibly get. So that part is super easy. Now we have breaks. We have a morning break, an afternoon break, and a longer lunch break. So during those breaks, you have options. We will start by uh, right back here. If you walk back through the same door you came in and go to this get gravel area, you will see a ton of canopies with all kinds of really, really cool activities, uh, more demonstrational, some uh, handouts. So we have uh, a canopy for a Native Plant Society of Texas. We have another canopy called Ask a Master Gardener. So if you have you know, a gardening question, we have very special garden smart people to answer those questions for you. And I promise you that if they don't know the answer, they're not gonna make something up. They're gonna be honest. Also, we have a uh, demonstration of how to um, set up your own drip irrigation system at home. There is also a seed starting station. And of course, there is the beautiful stream trailer from Upper Trinity. It's a really, really cool setup. It's basically a trailer that has a flowing water system that fully shows in a smaller scale how this water moves in the landscape as far as watershed, you know, rivers and creeks into a delta. So that part is going to be super, super interesting as well. And I'm sure that kids will love watching all of that as well. So breaks are great. Lunch. So we have about an hour lunch break. If you pre-purchased box lunches, you should have in your punch card, the one you got when you uh, checked in. In the back, uh, you should have a color little sticker with whatever you order. So there is a door right there with that beautiful lady just closing it right now. That's Ashley. Hi, Ashley. So that door right there, if you pre-purchased the box lunch, you're going to go after the second class through that door, get your lunch, and there is another set of double doors into the outer portion of Solomon's porch that those uh, tables and chairs over there. There are other uh, picnic tables throughout the prayer garden. Uh, I forgot to say that another activity, it's probably the, my favorite one. It's a garden tour. So this is how it's going to work. Mr. Christopher Davidson, he is the manager here at the, with the prayer garden. And he will be staying right outside that door right there. There is a big uh, stairway. He's going to be standing right there. And uh, what he's going to do is give you a three to five minutes quick description of who we are as far as Global Spheres, close to 40 acres, about 25 acres of garden and grounds that we work on for the past 12 years. So we have the Israel Prayer Garden right here outside the door, the Bila Barnyard going that way with our farm animals. And then if you keep going that way past the Israel Prayer Garden is our community garden and uh, agroforest. So the way it's gonna work is this, you're gonna say hello to Mr. Christopher. He's gonna give you a quick description and you are free to walk through it. So we have our garden crew staff members, strat is hard word, strategically positioned in certain areas throughout the whole fields to not only direct you to where to go, but if you have any questions, they're probably the better, uh, best trained people to help you with that. Um, during lunch as well, let me go back to lunch. As you're walking around, you're gonna notice that outside in the fields, there are no trash cans. We purposely remove them all. So you don't have the option of forgetting your trash behind. So all the trash cans, are uh, conglomerated here outside at Solomon's Porch. You have trash cans inside this room. You have all the trash cans over there. It will help us to keep the gardens clean. You know, there are uh, wildlife habitats and water and a pond. So you're gonna get to see all of that. Um, my advice is don't try, if you're deciding, choosing to go take the garden tour in one of the breaks, don't feel pressure that you have to see all three areas in one break. You know, you may choose to go to one, you're walking by the other one. So feel free to move around and make your own decision and enjoy it, right? Uh, 
door prizes and punch cards. So for those who are watching all four classes in the day, last class is done at 4.30. So after that, you cannot forget that before the, first, the last class, we're gonna have a bucket here by the door where you have to drop your punch card in because in your punch card, it has your name. And then at the end of the day, we're gonna, you know, not manipulate because I hope that, you know, I don't win all the prizes. So I'm probably not gonna drop my punch card in there, but we want to make that drawing and make it fun for you. Here are, here are the, the prizes you're gonna get to choose from. We'll give you more instructions on how many, uh, how, which one you can choose and all that, but we do have uh, rooted in with this amazing product that they sell. Uh, they're actually, uh, we are one of their pickup locations. By the way, if you did pre-purchase a plant box, which is a pollinator garden box or a shade garden box, um, you have to pick up your box over there bef to, between nine and 12. So we'll find a way to make it convenient for you. Uh, and if you are freaking out about how am I going to get that plant box and shove it in my car and it's going to be hot. So Outside of the gravel area here, there is a little cone section under the shade with access to water if you decide you want to give it a little drink throughout the day. So you can go ahead, put your name on your plant box, and you can set it out there. Everybody out there knows where that area is. All you have to do is ask, right? And we also have our, um, we purchased a uh, Bokashi bucket. It's a a compost, an indoor composting strategy for small spaces. It's really, really cool. You get to, uh, as it's decomposing, fermenting, you get to harvest the, the compost tea, which is a great uh, liquid fertilizer, all natural. So that's part of the prize as well. And that beautiful little basket right there, that's a gift basket from Beulah Acres Bounty. So that's the, the tag, the brand, that we sell our Bula Acres products as well. Basically saying everything that we plant and work around within the 25 acres we have here, we harvest everything, we bring it to the kitchen, we process, we preserve, we turn into amazing products as well. So it's so, almost like uh, the best of the month becomes something. So we love that ability to be able to close the cycle, right? If you're have a veggie garden, you're only gonna plant a veggie garden if you wanna eat those vegetables, right? So, so keep that in mind. There are some really, really cool, amazing products here with teas and oils and salts and uh, beauty products. And what else? Uh, elderberry syrup, uh, tinctures, you know, so you can, you're free to walk by and kind of take a look at it, sort of like, you know, say a little prayer. I hope I win the drawing at the end of the day and I want that box. And if I'm not the first one to be drawn out of the bucket, hopefully that first person would not pick my basket kind of thing. So I'll let you do your own prayer about that. Um, now, let me see time. We're doing good. So the way you came in, you drove in is enter only, correct? Exit. If you remember the big parking lot back here, all the way back there to our left side, to the extreme south of the property, there is a, a chancel, is that what it's called? A gate, automatic gate, exit only. There are signs saying exit, meaning nobody's gonna drive in through there. And if you try to drive back from where you drove in, you're gonna cause trouble for everybody. So don't do that, please. So we're trying to keep all the parking lot smooth, you know, when you're ready to go, be mindful that there are other people, people in the parking lot. By the way, you see there is a there is a roadway that turns around right here along the prayer garden. We blocked that off uh, so nobody can drive a car there as well. So you're free and safe to walk around anywhere you want. Um, trash and recycles, we already talked. If you need Wi-Fi, there is uh, our GSC public. And then again, if you're out there in the fields enjoying having a good time and you're like, oh, I wish I could use the bathroom. They're right here. So maybe go to the bathroom before you go over there or come back just in time to use the bathroom without disrupting the next class. I think that's it. Uh, does anybody have any questions? One question. No questions. Great. Okay. So that means we're doing a good job. I appreciate y'all coming. We're going to get ready 
uh, to start the first class. Uh, just give us a couple more minutes. Thank you so much. So now we are at the highlight of the morning. And not only is Daniel witty and charming, he's also very, very smart and an excellent educator. So I could probably spend the whole morning talking about all of our instructors here today and how wonderful they are. But let me just hit the highlights for you about Daniel. So not only is he our Denton County Master Gardener Association Education Director, he's a veteran master gardener of nine years, He's also a master naturalist. He's an urban garden specialist, a permaculture designer, educator, specialist. He's the Beulah Acres uh, Agroforest Project Manager, the Global Gardeners Project Manager, and that's not all. He's also a cover model because... <laughs> If you see, we have some edible DFW magazines that are around. There's some where you registered. There's some in the back. And they recently did a feature, Daniel Cunningham of Rooted In wrote it, on the Beulah Acres Agroforest here at Global Sphere Center. So inside, there's some wonderful information about that, pictures of the whole team and the whole garden. But Daniel made the cover. So if you've got your Sharpie, he will autograph at breaks and lunch, right? And so we're going to start with our first class this morning, Understanding Rainwater and Watersheds. And I guarantee you, it will be good to the last drop. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Sorry. I might need this. I might need a little drink of water, too. By the way, I had no idea that they were going to put my picture on the cover. I promise you, like they came over to take all kinds of really nice pictures, you know, and showing the flowers, the produce and there. Oh, this is a good cover picture. I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's awesome. The next day when they published it, I was like, what are y'all doing? You got to at least tell me or something, you know, and they're like, well, that's that's our trick with the magazine. Nobody knows the cover until the last night before we launch it. Um, and there are some, let's say, some friendly people saying, hey, if you autograph the, you know, my copy, I may be able to sell it for five bucks next year. So I'm like, well, five is bigger than one. So uh, let's we're waiting for the PowerPoint. So, so far, so good, everybody. What do y'all think? Is it working right? Mm. OK, so while the PowerPoint is in progress. Uh, the way we lined up the classes throughout the day, it's uh, number one, if you are a gardener or a naturalist, meaning like you've been practicing and studying and educating yourself, you know, for a while, uh, you'll be refreshed of a lot of information. But the way we're going to connect one class to the next one is to provide you some very key uh, information and, and topics that all combined together, not only gives you uh, sort of like the best version of the garden you can have. So you have those tools, like your brain is kind of like garden ready sort of thing. And, um, and then at the end, like you have always the benefit of promoting um, Texas native uh, eco region. And at the very end of the day, you're gonna see how can you enhance your native local ecoregion in a way that benefits uh, your food crop fields or your veggie garden. So we start with water because that's not my, that should be my computer, yeah. Um, so we, we, have a, we have a saying here, uh, and it is something that if, you, if you're familiar with permaculture, um, good quality water good soil quality, good seed quality, that's all you need. So from there, you add up everything else around it, but it's almost like I have this amazing quality tree that I want to plant in my property, but I have horrible soil. So there is always the work in the soil around it before you put that plant in place and the right plant in the right place. Um, you know, different requirements and needs and all that, water, uh, sun and shade, uh, type of soil. 
So there are many, many elements that combine together uh, gives you a, a optimal area for your garden, right? But without good water and without good soil and without good seed or, or uh, uh, plant quality, it uh, becomes a little harder to accomplish what you are trying to do. So keeping in mind that soil and water are always key. We're gonna start with water. Of course, you know, to honor as well, our friend Blake, you know, with water, you know, I hope he doesn't get upset with me because I'm about to show some stuff here that he probably did not know I would have in my slides. It's not a picture of him, so it's, it's all good. Uh, but it is all about water. Oh, there you go, okay. Uh, welcome, <laughs> rainwater and watershed. So let's pretend I'm beginning right now. <laughs> welcome, everybody. It's a pleasure to have you here. You know, today we're going to talk about rainwater and watershed. We're going to understand a little more what does it mean to have a watershed natural system and how does that apply uh, to your property, big or small backyard a small suburban house or a big amount of acreage, there's always something you can do. When you, when you feel like you found a problem, that actually may be the solution. So, you know, keep your hearts and, and brains open to receive all that information. And uh, let's go to the first slide. So, first of all, what is a watershed? You see that big map full of colors and, Thicker lines, thinner lines. So this is a representation of all the watershed system in the United States. Doesn't seem like much, right? When you're talking about conservation or we just came out of a drought season, it rained a lot, but it's still kind of dry. But there is a lot of water in this country, right? So a watershed is basically... A, an area or a ridge of land that separates water and makes that water move to um, maybe smaller bodies of water to bigger bodies of water. So there is always a transition between uh, one area and the next one. Great, yeah, the light helps a lot. Please don't fall asleep. Um, but also uh, you can use the terminology of watershed as a turning point or a milestone. For example, these works that we're doing today mark a watershed in the history of North Texas. After today's classes, uh, and you're, when you're out of here at the end of the day, driving safe back home, you're gonna have all this amazing, bright new ideas and knowledge, and you will get home and be like, oh, let me look at my property. I know I've been doing all kinds of good stuff, and I know I can do better. Right, so we're changing things starting now with the first slide and you'll see why I'll make the connection. But there are three uh, main uh, different types of watersheds. So there are natural watersheds, sort of self-explanatory, right? There are rural watersheds and there are urban watersheds. So those are the three main categories that you can, according, you know, in the map and areas, uh, those are the th uh, three main ones you're going to find out there if you're deciding to Google about the subject or, you know, Siri, Siri knows a lot, but she doesn't know everything. Um, but it's worth asking her some questions sometimes. So now jumping to the next slide. Let me move her. I move a lot. I'm sorry, camera. Um, so first of all, you see that in our planet Earth, 70% water, have you ever heard that before? 70% of our planet is water. So with all the water in the globe, the average numbers are 97% of that water is in the oceans. So that only leaves us with 3% fresh water. From that 3% fresh water, 77 is frozen, right? Less accessible. So the remainder of the water, 22 is groundwater, which means it's underground, and then it leaves us only 1% of surface water, accessible water. So all the lakes and rivers and streams and green belts and creeks, all of that in the planet Earth represents 1% of accessible fresh water. That's why it's so important that everything you do in your lifestyle in general, but also in your gardens makes a huge difference, right? 
let me see, we'll jump to this side right here. So understanding your watershed or the watershed around you in your city, in your town, in your community, in your backyard is very important because not only you will know how to properly efficiently use that water, but you're also going to benefit your local ecoregion. It's more than, uh, I wanna take three showers a day at home. You know, you gotta keep in mind that all that water is, should be also going somewhere else. And there are all kinds of wildlife and animals out there that depend on that quality water, right? So wildlife, plant, and humans depend on quality water to live. So see like those are areas that you find uh, they're more, they would be considered more of a natural watersheds, right? Repairing areas, green belts, streams, creeks, rivers, lakes, ponds, springs, oceans, wild areas, and aquifers. So those are mostly um, described as water that you can find a way to get to, right? It's either you go to it or it comes to you, right? So very quick, we're back in fourth grade, I guess. Water cycle, y'all remember this? But I do have to mention, because all the water on the planet Earth is the same as it has ever been. Through water cycle, naturally, it circles around, it penetrates the soil, the soil absorbs and it percolates and goes to a bigger body of water. From there, there is water moving, evaporation, evapotranspiration from the trees, you know, sort of like uh, you go to the Amazon rainforest and it's so humid, why? because there is a lot of evapotranspiration from the trees. It means that under the canopies of those huge amount of trees all combined together, it's a different ecosystem. It has more um, uh, humidity in the air, right? Does that make sense so far? Great, I'm glad I'm not complicating too much. So evaporation, condensation, boom, rain, that water falls in the ground again, or on the streams or in the creeks, whatever the case may be, right? So. Just a quick uh, glossary, oh, description of um, how you can call your water. So first of all, as far as rainwater, every time it rains, it helps regulating your climate, air humidity, you know, it benefits and balance this whole water cycle within the ecosystem in your region, right? So when you're talking about surface water, that's the water that is more accessible to you. It's either you're pumping it from somewhere, the city is bringing that water to you. So it's water that you can pretty much jump in the pond kind of thing. It's accessible to you. You open the water faucet, there's water. Now, when you talk about groundwater, it's less accessible. It will require some sort of labor equipment. Digging a water well in, my, in the back of my property is an example. So it's one of those things like you can't just go get it. You have to get to it first and have a way to pull it out, right? So there are strategies within strategies and runoff is one that we're gonna talk a lot today as well. Uh, basically is water that hits a surface and runs somewhere. Quick example, if, you're, if it's raining and it hits, hits the roof of your house, it's a very quick runoff, right? If it hits the soil, as it's, the rain's hitting the soil, the soil is absorbing some of it and it runs off less. We get to different soil types. I'm not gonna you know, steal nobody's magic for the for next class about soil nutrition, but it is that situation where, you know, over here, for example, uh, we have mostly clay soil which means that the water does not penetrate that fast, which means you have a lot of runoff, right? So in a sandy, sandy soil example, the water will hit the soil and penetrate super fast. So very little runoff, great absorption, right? Maybe too much. So getting that out of the way, so you sort of have a better idea and difference between uh, surface water, groundwater and runoff, now we're gonna funnel down a little more back to urban watershed education. So that's all about understanding that big time balance between the water you need, the water your family needs at home, the water that wildlife needs and natural ecosystems, uh, riparian areas, um, um, preservation parks, conservation sites. So think about it, everybody needs a little water. 
at some point, if not every single day, many times of the day, not just us, but plants and wildlife as well. So watershed education, it's the balance between all those natural, naturally designed by nature needs, right? Uh, a few issues that you can see in this, this uh, watershed cycle, um, it's uh, pollution, erosion, and other urban challenges that may happen. Quick example is I was born and raised in Brazil. That's why I sound a little funny. English is not my first language. I apologize. And TH words are super hard. So don't make a joke while I'm standing here. Um, but because of that, just like there are towns within counties, within the states, there are watersheds within smaller watersheds within bigger watersheds, bigger bodies of water in drainage basins. So it's basically, remember that big USA map? That's the bigger picture, biggest picture within US. And then as you funnel down to your backyard, it's part of the same watershed system. Uh, for example, the rain that falls on a driveway may flow and run off into a stream that flows into a smaller pond that flows into through a green belt to Lake Louisville. So that's our example here in Global Sphere Center. We'll have pictures at the end. I'll explain a little more. But basically, all of our southern neighborhoods over here, their urban water, we are, uh, they all come to our property here. We have a four acre pond here which is an official Lake Louisville watershed before it gets to the actual Lake Louisville. So we are one of the points that uh, overspills into Lake Louisville. So a quick cycle, just so you understand, let's say this is Lake Louisville, right? Big body of water around your area. That water has to be pumped out of that big body of water to be treated, processed, uh, sanitized, brought it back into your house so you can use it. Then as you're using that water, the water has to go somewhere to a wastewater collection first to be cleaned up again before it falls into the circuit here that I was just describing. Then it goes to the big body of water. Did I say anything wrong, Blake? Awesome. Please correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> um, so understanding the cycle, it's, it's really like, well, you're probably not in Dallas, but if you are you know, in a big apartment complex, so you're right here and there's all of this happening just in your neighborhood, right? Make sense so far? I'm doing good on time. I'm doing great on time. Where's Catherine? I was about to say, you got to sit right there because if I get lost, I look at you right, right, Catherine? Yes, and she's not there. So I will pick another victim, my cousin maybe. <clears throat> okay, so next, let's go to the next slide. That's where it gets super cool. And that's why we're here today. You see that red dot right there? By the way, I got all this information from the Upper Trinity website. <laughs> uh, that red dot right there is where we are right now in Corinth, Texas. So that huge blue line, the outer line right there, it's what is considered the Upper Trinity Regional Water District. So now you see all the rivers and creeks and bigger body of water, the lakes and all that. So within all of that, that's what Upper Trinity does for us to provide us with quality drinking water, usable water in our shower, in our home. So all the programs and everything they do is actually to educate you better that whatever you're doing at home, good or bad, there is always a little better you can do, right? Because it benefits not only you and your neighbors, but there are not just the future generation, our kids that will need quality water as well. Hopefully they have a better water quality than we have now, but all the gardens and ecosystems around it, think about it around those big lakes, there is all those native areas around it that need quality water, right? So Upper Trinity has been around since 1989. I was only eight years old and they cover Denton, Collin County. It's over 29 communities where they give, they provide all the amazing uh, water quality to over 350,000 people. I think it's actually more just because it's so many cities all connected together. Um, but I just wanted you to understand, remember that huge US map 
funneling down, funneling down, funneling down into where we are right now, which is still a bigger scope. And now we go, we funnel it again into rainwater harvesting. So now you are, uh, from now on is more uh, applied to things you will see easier at home, right? So let's see right here. Benefits from harvesting rainwater. So when you're harvesting rainwater, the name itself already tells you what's going on, right? You're harvesting. So you can capture that water. You can move the water somewhere else. You can store it for later use. If you have a proper treatment system from your rainwater collection strategy, it can also be uh, drinking water. There, are, uh, there is technology for that. But also in your home landscape, it can save you money by reducing your water bill. It can also... Uh, reduce the demand of the municipal water supply. So think about when they, when it's a drought season and they say, hey man, like in your neighborhood, you should not be watering things more than twice a week. And here we're like, oh, twice a week, you know, so it's can be tricky. But how about if we all have that acknowledgement that whatever we do as far as our water use at home, being wise and efficient, it could be different right now. It's all about how much water you have reserved in the biggest bodies of water to send it back to us, right? You know, so whatever we're doing, we're helping out over time. Uh, makes efficient use of a valuable resource, reduces flooding, erosion, surface water contamination. We're going to talk about that as well in the next slides. But basically how it works is you have a, uh, a supply of rainfall. You have a demand which is how much water do you need to use, do you usually use at home? And then it goes to, uh, depending on the collection system you chose from to harvest that rainwater. And there are simple and complex systems. So simple systems that as it rains, it moves that water right away somewhere. More complex systems that require proper equipment, maybe a setup and all that. We'll have more slides about that as well. But just a quick reference number. In many of the communities in the United States, uh, 30 to 50% of your water bill comes from irrigation. So isn't that crazy? It's more, it's almost like we use more water in our gardens than we use at home, right? Average numbers, you know, don't throw any chairs at me. Uh, it's just, you know, part of the research, part of the numbers that we want to show you uh, what actually reflects as far as your water usage at home. Then we jump to the next slide. So now let's identify your house very quick, right? So you heard all about that. I'm about to give you some good news as well. So in your house, first of all, there are many important things that you need to understand in your property. Again, doesn't matter if it's a small backyard, if you have a huge garden or not, if you want to have more gardens because you don't have enough, don't matter the case, whatever you decide to do as far as your landscape designing project, uh, you have things in place. So for example, you have to take all that in consideration. So let's say you see that identify right there. Uh, from identifying or assessing what you have in place already, it makes it easier to sort of like enlighten your head uh, of what kind of uh, rainwater harvesting system will work best for you. There is also your budget, right? Like if you tell me, I am a multimillionaire, I can do whatever I want. Great, let's pick a complex system maybe, you know? Or as a matter of fact, the amount of money you spend on the system doesn't really reflect how efficient it can be. We're gonna show some, some examples here, but right now, my friends, we're all multi-billionaires. It doesn't matter. We're not thinking about money, we're thinking about efficient system, right? So you have all the hardscapes, you know, the driveways, stairs, uh, steps, uh, roof, if you have maybe, are you already tracking all the utility lines? You know, if I have irrigation in my backyard, there are pipes over there, gas lines, electrical lines, internet lines. So knowing where all of that is first, before you start digging, or you already start by saving a lot of money just by knowing that. Uh, I can tell by experience and I know that if I say, have we ever done that before? Many hands will come up. Um, you're trying to get your garden ready and you boom, hit a pipe and then you're like, Ugh, 
now I got to get somebody to fix this pipe or my garden project will have to be delayed for next month because I'm super busy and I got to fix the pipe first. And that's only if you're hitting a water line. If it's a gas line or an electrical line, it can be a little more complicated to fix. Not impossible, but complicated, right? Um, so there is a system um, in the United States, a phone number, 811, call before you dig. It's a service that you can call and ask somebody, you know, wait for your turn that they send someone to your backyard to work on it and identify all that stuff for you. So great, you have a better blueprint of what you already have in place, right? Uh, then of course, like if you already have uh, downspouts and rain gutters, uh, maybe you have a potential area that would be great to have that system, that simple urban system, but you don't have yet. So it's one of those things, maybe before, as soon as you start gardening, you have to garden. It's not just throw soil in there, you know, bury some plants and they're going to grow happy without you doing anything at all. You know, it will require a little tenderness and, and caring and love to help those plants to mature and get established. So having all of your hardscape and all the assessment in place first will save you a lot of headache and extra labor uh, in the future. So also your plant selection, you know, right plant in the right place. Uh, it's just a quick example. Say like you want, I really want to have a veggie garden in my backyard. And then you will hear more about it at the end of the day. Not standing, nobody's thunder again, but it does, a veggie garden needs sun. So if you have your veggie garden right under that huge post oak tree that is fully shaded, and by the way, grass doesn't even grow underneath it, right? That's probably not the best place for your veggie garden. It needs sun. So things like that, by selecting, uh, understanding your plant selection, which by the way, you have the Native Plant Society and SMS Garden booth out here, which you, where you can ask those questions as well. So knowing which plants you're gonna put where and what kind of garden you're wishing to uh, design and put in place helps a lot. So understanding sun and shade patterns as well, basically means we are, in the northern, hard with the TH, northern hemisphere, right? So that means that our sun, mostly, most of the times throughout the day, it's slightly angled to the south, always. If I was in Brazil, still it would be the opposite way. So if your sun is angled to the south and that's our north and I am a tree, the shade is always going to go to the north side somewhere. It changes angles throughout summertime. It's a little, the angles are a little more uh, closed. Uh, in the winter time, the angle is a little shorter. So it means you have a lot more shade projection during the winter. So you see my point, like understanding how sun moves or casts shade or projects uh, sunlight in your backyard will help you a lot to identify the best spot for the best garden you want to have there. And of course, points of view, uh, it's one of those things. Um, I want to have that beautiful garden. If I'm in the kitchen, I have a beautiful window. I'm doing my dishes, trying to conserve water. I want to look outside and see like this amazing garden. And then, uh, I don't know, maybe you chose, that was a good spot for your veggie garden, but you're not keeping up with it too much. So every time you're on that window, you're like, oh, I got to go over there and pull weeds. Oh man, I should have done this past, oh, but it was so hot. Is it time to plant cucumbers already? You know, so you're, instead maybe you have, see, that's your choice, right? See like that, that's probably something I would like to do because I will never forget about the garden. The best garden location is a location where you're going to walk by often. So you're not neglecting it, right? Or you can have that beautiful uh, native Texas perennial flower garden, a pollinator garden maybe that is blooming throughout the, the seasons and it's colorful and you get to see some bumblebees. So that's a lot more pleasing when you're washing dishes. So see like those are options. Um, so points of view are super important. Then of course, uh, service areas. Say like you have your AC units on the side of the house or you know the, the recycling and trash wheelies, you know, if you're living on the side of the house or inside the garage, or maybe you have um, your compost pile in the backyard. So you're tracking basically how do you behave in your home every single day? I go from here to there this many times a day. It doesn't have to be radical 
as I'm making this sound right now, but I promise you that you understanding your behavior within your dwelling place will help you a lot as well to fit and, uh, and uh, make that garden design interact with who you are already to the point where you're going to be like, maybe I should go outside more often, you know, and enjoy the vitamin D from the sun and take care of my veggie garden because I do want to harvest cucumbers. That's why I planted cucumbers kind of thing because I like to eat it, right? And the uh, ground slopes is also a, an incredible uh, assessment element to have, to, uh, to identify and understand. Because remember, every time it rains, you're doing nothing. And when it rains, the water is going to go somewhere. And if, say, your house in a suburban area, as an example, most likely it's the highest place to prevent flooding. And if it does, your house supposedly not underwater, right? Have you noticed that when you have your fence lines between your neighbors, it's usually ditched into the fence? That's part of urban planning. So basically, you walk outside your back porch door and you're looking at your backyard. You're already sort of like trained to be, if it's raining right here and I have horrible clay soil that has a lot of runoff, most likely it's going to move that way. Then when it rains a lot, you're at your back porch looking outside being, man, I wish I could do something in that corner because it floods all the time. You may have that problem as well. Remember the problem is the solution, correct? We're gonna get there again. There is an app right here. I don't know why it's super dark blue, apologies, but it's called Water My Yard. It's a really, really cool app. It's a website, you can download an app on your phone. Basically, you type your location in there, your zip code and all that, and it will give you, if there's any um, very important information about water, in your region, it will be right there. It's either if it's a drought or uh, there's a lot of precipitation to come, uh, don't water your heart this much. So all those, those uh, important information about utilizing water in your area, watermyyard.org. So that's a really, really cool app as well. Uh, and of course, let's slide, let's a uh, little corner right here. Is it working? Hello? Yep. <clears throat> Sorry, am I speaking too loud? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I usually don't use these things. I just yell very loud naturally. Brazilian style, you know. <laughs> uh, not telling you to break your HOA rules ever. But if you do have HOA, it's really well worthy to find out what are those codes of ordinance before you do anything. And I'm telling you that not to start creating um, some blockage or kind of like, oh man, I can't do nothing because the HOA doesn't let me do anything. Man, I'll tell you what, it's a trick, right? Find out that information first. But say, as an example, in your front yard, they may require you to have a certain type of tree or this many bushes uh, in front of the house that if they're looking good and healthy and all that, they have to be about the size have ever went through those details. So I'll tell you right now that there are many places that you're not breaking no HOA rule and you're sort of like designing your front yard to be your edible herb garden. So a beautiful rosemary that bushes out like this tall and it smells amazing right by your front door. It blooms purple flowers in the spring. And that's so cool because everybody that walks in your house is already going like, man, this house is nice, you know? It's colorful, and then you go like, hey, welcome, hold on, let me just get some rosemary. I'm about to prep some chicken for us. I would like to have some rosemary. So there are strategies, that's what I'm trying to say. Find those boundaries, ask the question first, and be creative within the boundaries that were created through HOA. Don't break no rules, but be wise within those rules, right? The one problem is that they're recording now, they can sue me, can they? <laughs> No, but I didn't say, I did. I told you to not break the rules, right? So that's all that matters. Okay. So design possibilities. So very quick, whatever the strategy is, there are more strategies than this here, but it's all under the same concept. You're trying to harvest rainwater. 
So if we start from the left, I'm going to go in front of the projector very quick. So that's your house right there. Beautiful salmon brick looking house. You do have rain gutters and you do have downspouts. So if you're just on this portion right here before the cistern right there, you see you have this downspout going into a French drain. So basically, the, you remember, you know how you have those uh, those concrete little square pieces to like as the water is hitting too hard right there, you're not gonna dig a hole in your backyard. So you can have a French drain that will move that excess water to maybe your pollinator garden in the backyard. So you're already designing with the French drain through your garden. Maybe you want a, a little cool Japanese looking bridge over that French drain or that river rock. So you see my point, like that water is falling freely and in better quality that you can have. And you're moving the water with its natural flow to a proper area in your backyard. So you can also have by the back door or the front door, you can have, you know, flagstones as an example. So basically, I don't know if you've ever been to uh, Sprouts and they have those parking spots. They're kind of like a lot of pavers and it has a little grass or gravel in between. So that's all to help with uh, water percolation in the soil in a parking lot. That's a very, very cool strategy. And you can decrease the scale of all of that and apply it to your backyard. So you're helping with avoiding flood, you're creating design elements in your backyard. By the way, Sprouts don't give me no commission by speaking their name. Um, and I'm not even Amazon because I'm probably gonna use their name too. Uh, so now you have cisterns, right? So you have that gutter system into the tank. So you're storing that water. Uh, if you had a big one, it will probably help you a lot. Is it? I think I jumped something. We'll, we'll see next slide. You're storing that water to later use, or you're storing that water already to use. If you're harvesting water of whatever strategy, it is meant to be used, right? Um, so you can do similar system, like I want to have a bigger storage area, because then from there, I want to have a French drain that takes that water somewhere. Or maybe I'm storing water over there, and hopefully it fills up all the way to the top and you have your overflow pipe that that overflow will bring water to your garden. So there are other possibilities. Or for example, a mulch basin. Basically a trench that goes from here to there or just a oval shape right here. It means that when it rains, you design that your backyard to move that water into the mulch basin where you're gonna have plants and all that. So it will retain more moist moisture in the soil, better soil quality for your plants later on, right? Um, so then you have berms. Berms are really, really cool. So basically, instead of digging down in a mulch basin, you're berming up like a mound or a wall. Almost like if you're properly identifying your backyard, and you're thinking ahead of time because nobody wants to work more than we should, the best gardener is the laziest one. Nobody left on that one, but that's okay. It will make sense because check it out. If you're digging right here, like if you're gonna dig, you're gonna have to labor, correct? Somebody's gonna help you hopefully. But as you're digging, you're removing soil off the ground. Instead of putting the wheelbarrow and take it all the way over there and moving back the wheelbarrow and all that, you properly design first that as you're digging from here, already berming up right there. So essentially you have your berm into a mulch basin. A lot less work. If you're gonna have to labor, let's be wise about it. But a berm system, basically it stops water or it moves water or say like if it's a down slope, you have, there is a, a strategy in permaculture called J-cup snaking the water down. Basically what it is, it's a, it's a, say you have a bigger slope in your backyard and instead of making a terrace garden with straight lines, you make those gardens more like this. You're berming, so the water hits right here, hits the first berm with the, the bioswale maybe, the excess water runs down, overflows to the next one, that overflows to the next one. So that way you're slowing the speed of the water, 
you're giving it more time to permeate in the soil, to percolate in the soil. You're irrigating your gardens, and maybe you're avoiding a flood down there in the bottom of your property that you, you always have problem. You put all kinds of French drains, you paid thousands of dollars for somebody to almost like raise your, your tool shed like this high. You know what I mean? So how about you stop that water before it gets there and slows it down as you're irrigating, as you're creating better soil quality. So that's one strategy uh, with berms. And there is also a, uh, a gardening method called uh, hugo culture. Basically what it is, is as you're doing all that job and you're making a berm in the core of that pile, you have tree trunks or limbs. What happens is over time, that wood is going to keep absorbing water, absorbing water, you will turn into a sponge. So basically you're retaining moisture in the core of your berm system and it can be considered a low watering gardening method. Really cool because maybe you have a tree that is going over your roof and you know you're gonna have to spend, I don't know, whatever, many thousand dollars to hire somebody to go over there because it needs to be insured. It's a big tree. You don't wanna try to do it yourself and let it fall on your roof because then the insurance is not gonna cover it. So you see my point? All right, I'm gonna have logs then. If I'm gonna pay somebody to come take care of that business for me, make sure you use those logs in your garden design as an edging or maybe in the core of that mound under a hugo culture system it is a german um, gardening method there is also gabion walls uh, you can actually buy at amazon they don't make don't give me no commissions by the way again but it's uh, they are wired paneled structures that you can put together and create walls right you fill it up with rocks so what happens is there is a really really uh aesthetic look to it uh you can make a fence out of it to maybe stop all that water that is coming up here into your backyard, you're blocking it, not just creating a like a, a Hoover Dam sort of deal next to your house, because some of that water will still permeate through the gab Gabion wall, the rocks, and just a smaller por portion of that water is gonna come into your backyard. So it may be a solution for. There is a lot of water coming from up here here. So I'm just gonna build a wall right there. Well, but then you're not gonna get none of that water. So maybe I can do a gabion wall and get some of that water still in my backyard. And I'm gonna strategically plant my gardens on the inside of those gabion walls to get all that natural free water to help with irrigation. Is it making sense or is it too much? Great, I like the heads like this. So it means uh, it's working. And of course, like a rock swale, into a curb, uh, si uh, uh, street curb, curb cut. Think about it like in, a, in any road, right in front of your house, you have a curb right there. That is 100% designed as well to, as water is moving, it's easier to direct the water into those, what is it called, the, the whole culverts? Culverts. So, any excess water has to go to a place that can accommodate it before it falls into the urban watershed system. Remember that picture before? So that's actually a strategy as well. You know, there are places that if we didn't have curb cuts here, it would become a huge mess. So you see how much the identification of your house is important. Um, and also the rock soil, this is a strategy that uh, many businesses are adapting adopting actually um, to create uh, natural native environments in urban areas. So basically what they're trying to do as well is they identify that is a flooding point and that water is going nowhere and is maybe flooding the neighborhood down that creek down there, right? So instead of making a wall all the way down there in the neighborhood, let's track backtrack everything to where it's uh, first, uh, the water is falling in a huge amount, probably in a high point. Makes sense, right? Gravity water, gravity irrigation moves down. Um, so this is a good strategy as well. It has a very, very cool look with, um, you know, river pebbles and all kinds of granites and gravels and rocks. So different colors. So you can adjust and adapt all that into your own landscape design. Next slide is just a couple of ideas. I'm still doing great. Okay. I should be done in about 
30 minutes to four hours. So we'll be out of here quick. Okay, so, so passive harvesting strategies. That picture already says everything. Turn that into something like this, right? Again, that's a great example. It's called rain garden. It's a great example of how you can utilize a, you see how within all the possibilities you can have in your backyard, you're going to have to make a, a decision, a choice, right? So I kind of like that it floods only in the very back of my property and past my fence line, I can do nothing about it unless I'm very, uh, very much friends with my neighbor. Now think about if you have a neighbor you really don't like that much. So let's make that flooding spot in your backyard become something really cool for your landscape design, right? So there are uh, a lot of water loving plants, right? And you will hear a lot about um, uh, native plants of Texas uh, after lunch today. So I'm just getting you, getting you started for the rest of the day. Uh, another strategy is uh, a tree canopy. So now think about it. A tree is a natural water pump, huge root system. Any plant needs water to survive, to grow, to bear fruit, uh, to uh, bloom flowers. So they need water, some a little more, some a little, ma a little less, some barely none, because as an example, some, uh, some of the Texas native grasses, they have a root system that goes so deep down into the ground sometimes I, I think like 16 feet deep, they get all the water they need from all the way down there. It doesn't matter if up here is dry, their root system, they absorb water from their root system, right? So in the tree scenario, huge uh, root system absorbing a lot of water that goes through the uh, physiology of that tree into the leaves and then evapotranspirates. So basically a tree is the, biggest natural water pump you can ever find because you will get all the water to send it back into the atmosphere for condensation for rain right makes sense water cycle again right so having a tree canopy in your backyard number one is a tree is not an umbrella but if it's raining re raining really hard and you're out in the wild let's find a tree and stay underneath it because it's going to rain a lot less there right so meaning when it's raining, there is water touching the ground all over around the main trunk of that tree, under the canopy, outside of the canopy. So there is water going to the soil. But the drip line of the canopy, which basically means if the canopy is this big, that's the drip line right there. The, that excess water that hit, hits all the leaves are going to go boom, 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 and drape down right there, almost like if you're standing outside with an umbrella. That drip line area, it's big time area to plant uh, the proper plants and uh, harvest rainwater passively. It's gonna fall more water in there, right? So there is a planting uh, strategy called tree guild planting, G-U-I-L-D, which basically means you have a tree as the centerpiece of your that one specific garden design and around it, you plant the proper support plant species to help promoting that one tree. Pollinator uh, plants, uh, native grasses with deep tap root systems, maybe some herbs to as a pesticide plant, maybe some accumulators of nutrients, some nitrogen fixers. So there is a huge variety of plants you can put around that tree to benefit that tree. It's almost like if you have an apple tree, you will do a great job having the most pollination you can around it because uh, some of them need to be pollinated or they need to have uh, a partner to pollinate each other. So you have to bring those pollinators around that tree to, make to help the pollination process to work. And also uh, there is one thing in uh, uh, most of the, the, stone, the, the stone fruit trees, uh, in the case of the apple, it's called codling moth. It's a beautiful, horrible thing. It's a beautiful because it helps. It's part of the food chain ecosystem relationship, but it will devour, devour your tree. So by having the proper uh, pesticide plants around it, you decrease the chances of that pest 
getting to your apple tree. So you're not decimating them. You're just creating a protection barrier around your fruit tree. And it just so happens that most of those pesticide plants are herbs. And it just so happens that you, if you really like cooking, you have an herb garden around your uh, apple tree. So that's called companion planting. It's positioning around uh, next to each other plants that help each other out. Next slide. Okay, so now we get to active harvesting. So now it means, remember you're a multimillionaire. You can do whatever you want, right? I'm going to build that system and it can go as far as an underground cistern with all kinds of pumps and pipes that pumps the water out into irrigation lines so you're not using city water anymore. You're uh, not uh, uh, fully depending on the city or municipal water supply. Uh, you're trying to collect all that rainwater and harvest and store it because you're going to use it. Like there are systems you can move the water inside of your house, go through a, like a, a carbon sand gravel filtration system before it's pumped into your sink. And then when it falls from the sink, that gray water is properly well treated back into the cistern again. So you're creating your own water, uh, water circ. I'm going to call water cycle, but it's going to sound wrong. Let's just say a water circulation system from your active rainwater harvesting strategy. Make sense? So <clears throat> a this is a very complex example, of course. There are a little more simple examples with rain barrels. It is the number one popular rain. I'm rain, uh, harvesting rainwater in my backyard. Let's get a rain barrel. And it does work, right? So we're going to go back to that picture again. But now think about it. Just a number for your reference. One inch of rain in a thousand square foot roof area can give you potentially 600 gallons of water. How many gallons are here? Sort of like a regular trash can. 60 gallons, 65 gallons, 50 gallons, 100 gallons, you know, a bigger one. So one of these guys here, it's not going to do it, right? It's not going to store all that rainwater, that one inch rain you had yesterday. You, with one rain barrel does not give you the full capability of harvesting the most rainwater you can when it rains. Now you have the uh, possibility of not only connecting more than one barrel, you know, the overflow of this barrel overflows to the next one. And there are people that go crazy and they put like 20 of those barrels lined up. There is a lot more to it. You know, it has to be in a firm level surface. Uh, also, like you put the rain barrel touching the grass, it's great to harvest that water, but every time you're gonna you're gonna open that water faucet at the bottom and there's like, you know, zero pressure. So if you put that barrel a little up higher, you're using gravity to create pressure off of that rain barrel. So then now you're building a whole wall of rain barrels kind of thing. So that's where that strategy comes into place by selecting where it will be best to have a rain barrel already keeping in mind that it will overflow. Where is the water, the overflow water going? If it just goes down the drain, man, that's a possibility. It could go to your garden as well. Do you remember like the few, the, the few slides before this? So it gives you possibilities to re block, divert, redirect, store. So rainwater is amazing, right? It helps the whole system. So average water use of a one person per day average 80 to 100 gallons for one day so if you had a 100 gallon uh, barrel and you had a super complex system to move that water back into your house it's good for you for one day 100 gallons so now it makes you what i'm trying to do is uh have you understand of how much water we actually use every single day so a little bit less here and there, or efficiently moving the rainwater to the right spot will help you a lot, will help your neighbors, your community, and the whole uh, watershed system in our area specifically. But now if you get just a regular water hose, regular water hose, say like a three-quarter regular water hose, 
and you connect to an oscillating sprinkler in your front yard because you don't have an irrigation system and you let it run for about an hour. If you don't have that sprinkler and the water hose is just running freely, that's a thousand gallons in one hour. So it's a lot of water. If you, if you don't believe me, go back home, get a thousand uh, gallon bucket, <laughs> turn on your water hose and leave it there for an hour. I promise you it's gonna fill up. Just, just to have an idea, there are some areas around here that we don't have a uh, water hose right by it. So we have to water, uh, I'm sorry, we do have a water hose right by it and we have to water by hand. We don't have pipes or none of that, right? So then you're watering your tree. So let's say you found out that that one tree, uh, if that tree takes, I don't know, five gallons of water once a week, she should be fine, right? So then how do you know when you're sitting right there watering that tree? Oh, I think it's five gallons. So the way, one way we, we decided to do here is we got a five gallon bucket from Home Depot that we don't make no commissions as well. And we got the same water hose with the same water nozzle that we use to water our plants every time. We turned it on that bucket and we timed it. How long does it take to fill up five gallons? Oh, it takes 42 seconds. I promise you, try it, try it at home. It's not more than a minute. So then next time you go to that tree, you stay there for 42 seconds. I think it's five gallons. Gives you a peace of mind that you're giving the proper amount of water for the proper plant that needs that amount of water, right? So just a few strategies. There are two really cool links over there that you can follow, you know, many ideas. Uh, you know, there is a website as well to calculate uh, potential rainwater harvest uh, in your area according to the size of the roof. It helps, it gives you formulas to sort of like figure out those numbers out. And this right here, I apologize. But it says Pinterest right there, which we don't make commission as well at all. But if you decide to, do you, does anybody here have a Pinterest account? It's super cool. I suggest every, all my friends that if you're going to go on Pinterest to do your own research, don't do it at 10 o'clock at night because you're probably going to go to bed around four. You know, you're going to be pretty tired the next day. So meaning there are all kinds of amazing, great, great strategies, right? clicker and then here we go very quick i'm very close to the end now i promise that like that joke of four hours just went down to maybe 45 minutes but i actually only have 20 so i'm gonna push through uh this is us right here this is our property global sphere center i'm gonna use it as a case uh for us so we have the green dot here israel pier garden Bula acres is right here that's where we're sitting inside right now inside of this building right then we have uh, the Bill Acres Agroforest. So this is a map for you when you take the tour. You're gonna walk out of here. This is Prayer Garden. This is Community Garden and Agroforest. This is Bill of Barnyard. This is our uh, Louis, uh, Louisville Lake watershed pond in our property, about four acres pond. And uh, we do have the main building here. Uh, the yellow dot right there is, um, we, have, it's, we call it the uh, Community Oasis Wing because it has all kinds of businesses. It has a gym, a hair salon, a furniture store, a wellness center, and it has Illuminate Creative Arts and Studio. They are a uh, studio for kids and they offer all kinds of classes from music, theater, arts, gardening for sure, Global Gardeners under uh, SWAT, Science with Attitude, Junior Master Gardener, Junior Master Naturalists. And, um, there are over 500 kids from our community and cities around us that come to this property to take some classes, some, some sort of class. That purple dot right there is where we have our church. So yes, Global Sphere Center is under the umbrella, the higher umbrella of a non-denominational Christian international ministry. Sort of explains why you have a Brazilian guy in front of you right now. I did come here because of the church 12 years ago. And uh, so they, Glorizine International is what provides uh, and, and helps us out with everything that we're doing here. So they've been around for about 45 years now uh, with our uh, uh, apostle leader, Mr. Chuck Pierce, his wife, Miss Pam Pierce, 
is our direct boss in other gardens. We only have a garden and we only connected with master gardeners because of Miss Pam Pierce. She's also a master gardener and she makes sure that every year, if you work in our gardens, you better have proper education. So we're glad that she felt like that many years ago. And within our total of around 18 people in our garden crew today to manage 25 acres, um, I believe that eight or nine of them are certified master gardeners. There are two more interns. Every year we try to add you know, one or two more to our crew. So moving forward, we have the Bill Acres Agroforest, and it's a really, really cool project based on permaculture practices, regenerative agriculture, syntropic agriculture, all of those cool names just to say that we are very, very much interested into understanding what we have in place already. Remember soil, water, and seeds, and plants, and local ecoregion. We're fully uh, willing to understand what we have in place, to design something that will look really cool within the years. It will take some time. We are on the road for about two and a half years now. Our first goal is a five to seven year time frame to start seeing a much better established uh, agroforestry system. And there are areas there that we call a food forest. If you go on YouTube, like, man, you're going to love it. There's all kinds of stuff going on around the globe for since the 70s. And now it's becoming more and more popular. Uh, so there are many, many uh, opportunities that we have from here. Number one is the whole area is designed to have different gardening methods applied to a different area to find the self-sustainable point within that one design that benefits the next garden style to it, the next garden style to it, and benefits the whole thing at one, as one. So it's a two and a half acre project that combines community garden and agroforest with uh, infinity chicken gardens or a uh, um, uh, Texas native uh, forest in the back. So remember the sun exposure situation. So we're gonna have the highest canopies of trees all the way towards the north because when they're huge and they're gonna cast a bunch of shade, they're not gonna shade the areas that we know we need more sun exposure for the plants, especially if they're providing anything for us as human beings, you know, things to eat or fuel or herbs or medicinal plants. So you understand now that the water with solar solstice with your topography, the topography, your topography, like, you know, I used to be a large size, now it's extra large, it's not about that. It's about how your property looks and when it rains, where does that water go? So it's a bunch of elements combined together. And it is a place where we have volunteer opportunities, meaning you can come and volunteer. You don't have to be a master gardener to come and volunteer. We do have a, a website and it has a sign up genius page in there where you can just go over there and sign up for the dates you would like to come. We, I'm not gonna uh, say anything about the next slide. I'm gonna get to it first. Uh, but there are volunteer opportunities in experimentation and education. So it's designed, let's just say, we're open to make mistakes and we try to make the best ones. So then we can learn from it. And next year we can try to do something better. You know, there are some things that are pretty, obvious if you have been around gardening and sometimes you make the exact same mistake again but you learn better for the next season so we're not afraid to make mistakes that's what i'm trying to do uh explain and also the whole big scope of the design uh comes from us here but that also means that it only gains shape and shifts and change because we have passionate people that are willing to come and serve with us and maybe point something out that we're here every single day and we didn't see. And somebody comes and says like, oh man, did you see that? You know, it's not where, oh. <laughs> should feel embarrassed, but actually I don't because this is the purpose is for you to come and tell everything we're doing wrong so we can do better. So you are important as a volunteer. And those are things that, you know, this one area under Bula Acres and Global Spheres, that's what we can provide from those two and a half acres. So now when we get to, the, there are only two more slides, friends, I'm, I promise. 
So at the bottom here, February 2021. So you notice that like we identify our highest point to the low point right there. And you see there is a ditch line around it. That ditch line was already here since the 80s. That's part of the um, uh, stormwater management runoff from the urban planning of this property in the 80s. This used to be a Boeing facility, Boeing, Boeing, hard work, Boeing facility. So they used to make manufacture uh, uh, airplane uh, navigation parts. It was abandoned for many years up until we purchased the property around 12 years ago. So everything you see here, other than the roads and parking lots and super mature trees and the outer shell of all the buildings, everything else is our work in the past 12 years. And uh, in that project specifically, we identify the flooding point. See, like it just rained and it puddles a lot in that area. So we're mapping and watching like for real, going outside under the rain with rain boots and standing on the ditch and feeling how much that water is going with the tape measure. Like, oh man, that's like 18 inches. No chance, like it, I would never imagine 18 inches, you know. And then when it stops raining, we'll go back to that, we'll mark it. We'll go back to the same spot and be like, it's been three days since it rained a couple inches and we still have six inches of water in this spot. Great, so now we found through our topography map that we did uh, where to create a bioswale along the contour line of that topography leading that excess water into the pond. So because of that season, so that's February, 2021, right after the historical snow, snowstorm. That was February 14th, by the way, or within that week in 2021. So it was covered in snow. It melted, and because we were already interested in to building soil for our for the future, most of that water stayed in place. So we're like, okay, it looks pretty sad right now because we just came out of something I personally never seen in my life. It was like 30 something years, historical, 37, 31 years. So most of us, you know, probably never saw one of those before, you know, because you're all, you know, around 22 anyway, right? So I am too, 25, by the way. So we built that system and this is November, 2022. So a lot of the things that 100% die, we're like, it's over. Replant a bunch of that stuff. They all came back. So most within that year, like we, every year we plant more. But within that year, most of the things we decided to watch and give it a chance to see if they will come back. Because if it ever snows that bad again, we have a better idea of, of what kind of plant species that works really well here for the agroforest. And if they look dead or sad, we're willing to give it a chance. So we've seen it before, we're willing to see it again. So now, well, so this is a this is a spot for a, a gardening style called Three Sisters. is a Native American agricultural system, and then you have all the trellis lines. Those are all tunnels for a companion planting with grapes and berries and raspberries and blackberries and all that. Um, that over here, this is a, a um, it's called Wine Press. It's a Texas Native pocket right next to the community garden. So when you're walking from this building, this is where we are right now. You're gonna walk all the way to this arbor and you're gonna see probably like uh, two very good looking Brazilian guys over there to host you, you know, and welcome you. They probably walked away the room right now because they would be like, oh Lord. Um, and um, so you see like, we also thinking about access. If we ever need to drive an 18 wheeler in there, what are we gonna do? Man, we're keeping the center of the whole project open. So almost like we're conquering from the edges first, closer to the water. See those ditch lines? How can we work a little less and use more water in the beginning stages? Um, so this is a this is what is called this is our uh, our Texas native forest. This area here it's called a natural food forest. This is a more of a linear food forest strategy. That right there is the infinity chicken coop, vertical gardens, so on and so forth. There's a lot more out there is super fun. It, and if you, if you have a garden and you love Bermuda grass, I would invite you to come and volunteer here with us. 
because we have a lot of Bermuda grass and it is a battle. One good note on that is that it is a constant battle, 100%, a constant battle. But we had the same problem here in the Israel Pier Garden. It took about 10 to 11 years. But when you walk out there, you see that Bermuda grass is welcome where we want Bermuda grass. So it takes time, but it pays off. Um, next slide. There you go. February 2nd. Okay, so here we go. It's snowed again. That was early this year. Y'all remember that? It was not a historical snowstorm, but it did snow quite well. Thank God at the same time, because all that was the ice that fell, the snow that fell on our grounds, because we were, again, interested into building. Have you ever heard about lasagna gardening? You're going to hear more about it in the next class. So understanding all those soil levels and all that, that, that ice, as it melted, it didn't run off. It stayed there, most of it, right? It's hard to measure, but it gives us a great peace of mind that we built something for the years ahead. And if that happens again, I'm very happy to say that most of that melting ice water will stay in place for our gardens. And then, of course, you know, I got to, you know, brag about Elm Fork Chapter, Texas Master Naturalists, and then County Master Gardeners Association. They are 1 billion percent the two associations that made all this happen. It's almost like we had the vision, the passion. Let's get it started. Let's start working. Let's see, you know, our amazing friends around us, you know, people that for sure know a lot, knows a lot more than us that if we can get that project approved with the associations, it would be awesome to have that amazing people coming over as well. So that's why I am still, you know, part of gladly, honorably part of Master Gardeners and Master Naturalists, because you get to know a lot of amazing people. And uh, they're so amazing that they absolutely come and say, Daniel, man, but this is not and like, oh, yeah, we can fix it. We can fix it. No, we're, let's work around it. We can fix it. And then we get to um, June, July. It looks green to me. I'm going to tell you right now, we did struggle with the drought. Like everybody else, there were uh, watering restrictions. Uh, we did lose some stuff. But if you look at a picture like that from the drone in June, that because it rained in early June, June 4th, I believe, and it rained a good inch and a half here, close to two inches. So it was a good rain. And it never rained again until late August. So it looks pretty green to me. This is all to show you that you see every single one little thing you do right now may uh, uh, signify your success in the next year. So this is all designed to have good soil quality good water quality, good seed quality, right? In a way that we're making all the good mistakes and learn more with the people that we love when we have an opportunity like this today. Friends, whatever choice you make matters and it makes a difference in your community. And I'll tell you what, if your community is much better than last year, all the other communities around would be like, man, what are they doing? Because it looks so good. And we get to tell everybody, you know, we're proud that we've been working and changing things little by little. So that that uh, metaphor about it's a you know it takes a village or it's a it's an ant type of job, ant pile type of job. It means everybody has to do something, even if it's very small. But when you put it all together, it's a big time job. And then. Ta -da! This is the end, my friends. Thank you so much. I actually did a good job because it only took me about an hour to do my presentation. Usually takes me four, uh, but it was just one. Just a few sample pictures of things that we've seen around uh, here in our fields, in our uh, gardens and all. Uh, big time shout out to our main partners for today, Opportunity, Master Gardeners and Bill Acres with Global Spheres. And this is the time where I will remind you that it's 9.36 right now. Supposedly, we have till 10 o'clock. I know that everybody or most of you want to go to the bathroom. I'm here to answer questions. If you have any, if not, at 
from 10 o'clock to about 10 20 is your time to go around and visit the activities go to the gardens come back here in time next class starts starts at 10 30 and it's about soil nutrition it's going to be a really really good one do you all have any questions Doing on the community garden. On the community garden. Wow, who benefits from that? Is people able to come and get? No. How does that? How would this? We have a waiting list. Each plot belongs to a different gardener. We don't charge anything to today, but they are assigned to uh, different gardeners. Meaning, if you are on the waiting list and you end up getting a plot. Whatever you do there, there are some rules and regulations to follow. For example, like we are 100% organic here, never use one chemical ides of none of the ides in the market for 12 years. So if you're willing to follow those protocols, whatever you plant in your garden, it's yours. And we do encourage, you know, the community garden trading and some of that stuff goes to farmer's market or donations to um, our daily bread in Denton. So yes. And if you would like to get in the waiting list in our website, there is on the top right, there's a sign up button right there, all kinds of bubbles and newsletters and classes and volunteers. It's all in the website. And now is usually the time where people either give up or garden hard. One more question. Here we go. Uh, when you're when you're wanting to use the water that's running down the street and you need to cut the curb do you have to get city permission mm, there you go don't break the hoa rules <laughs> or the city rules if it if you need to get permission that's a question yes uh that's a great question you do most likely have to because if you're i would say if you're interfering with uh, regular roads uh or interfering to uh city maintenance responsibility areas we have mr mike to help me out you cannot change the flow of water in your neighborhood you have to get permission but if you're making a curb cut close to the street not in your landscape design any more questions one two three we're good <laughs>